We are live. Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Karen, founder and executive director of Empowering People with Invisible Chronic Illness Foundation, otherwise known as the EPIC Foundation. Thank you so much for joining tonight's panel. I appreciate all of you who have joined the other panels that we've had this week. We've had some really great panels, including what is your superpower, caregiver insights. We had an influencer night. And last night we had a night with our affiliates. It's been so much fun. Today's panel is called Coping with Chronic Illness. We have an eclectic group here of mental health professionals educators, social workers, psychologists. We have people who have dealt with chronic illness and they are now advocates themselves. So we have a really great group here and I think that you're gonna gain a lot from tonight's panel. I would like to introduce you to our facilitator tonight. Her name is Dr. Serena, psychotherapist, professor, chronic pain expert. I'm so happy to have you here. Thank you for coming back, Dr. Serena, and facilitating this discussion. And I'm just gonna go ahead and hand things over to you. Great, thanks, Dr. Karen. And thanks again for inviting me to be here tonight. I'm really excited, especially about this topic because I think a lot of people can really uh, speak to this, especially during these times um, with the whole pandemic and everything as well. Um, but welcome everyone. Thanks for spending your night here today. And uh, we'll just do some quick introductions. So if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself, Karen, if you wanna go first. Um, hi, my name is Karen Castle and I am the parent of a daughter about to be 26 who's dealt with a chronic illness for um, 10, 11 years or so. So every day is a journey. <laughs> Thank you, Stacy. Hi, everybody. My name is Stacy. Um, I'm a graduate of the Institute of Integrative Nutrition, and I help um, parents who have children that suffer from autoimmune diseases such as Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And I have a seven-year-old daughter who was diagnosed with Crohn's at three years old. Thank you for being here. Zoe Ann? Hi, I'm Zoanne Murphy, and I am a chronic pain patient, as well as multiple chronic illnesses. I'm also an advocate, and I am in uh, grad school for my PhD wow. in psychology. Oh, <laughs> congratulations. Thanks. Chanel? Hi, I'm Chanel Curtis. I am currently the Director of Health Services Administration here at the Epic Foundation. Um, I am a multiple-time chronic illness uh, survivor and self-advocate, push for advocacy very heavily. Um, just so happy to be here, thank you. Great, thanks for being here. Craig? Okay, hi, my name is Craig Timms. Uh, I'm, I don't have a chronic illness, but my wife does. I'm more of an advocate. I'm here to support uh, Karen and be a part of the panel. And I've been a part of uh, another panel on a, a I believe that was Monday or excuse me, Tuesday night. And it was so enriching. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here again and share and learn from, from all the other chronic illness warriors and other advocates. So I'm really looking forward to this and I'm happy to be here. Hey, thank you. El Cerita. Good evening, everyone. My name is El Cerita Crosby. I am a chronic warrior because I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease several years ago. I'm also an advocate for my students as I've been a public educator for over 30 years in a public school system. So I know that they have a lot of things that they deal with as well. Thank you, welcome. Henry? Hello everybody, I am Henry Chernier. Uh, I am a licensed professional counselor working with uh, individual adults, children, uh, couples and I am the nephew of a great chronic illness warrior known as Dr. Karen Timms um, and it is a huge honor to be a part of this panel tonight. Great welcome thank you Nancy. I am Nancy Montgomery um, I'm a registered nurse by trade I'm a chronic pain uh, survivor um, and I'm also the mother of a Cushing patient that some of you may know Brandy Fouché and I'm happy to be here tonight. Welcome, thank you. Erica? 
Hi, I'm Erica Brown. I am a cushion survivor. I have had two unsuccessful brain surgeries, radiation, a bilateral adrenalectomy, and now I am now a big advocate for cushion disease. Welcome, thank you. Dr. Dana. Hi, I'm uh, Dana Heron. I have a small psychotherapy practice in DC uh, dedicated to working with mind-body issues like, such as chronic pain and illness and eating disorders and fertility. Um, and I myself do not have a chronic pain or illness condition, but a tremendous amount of respect and awe for the people that, that do and that, um, that I get to work with every day. Welcome. Right. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, thanks everybody for being here. And today we're actually going to be talking about, um, you know, how do you stay sane? Basically, um, especially nowadays, you know, being a caregiver, working with individuals that have chronic illness, chronic pain, having it yourself. How, what are some things that you do from a, a mind, body, spirit, environmental perspective where you kind of keep, keep your own sanity going? Um, so I would love to open up that conversation up to everybody if you are willing to share some of your thoughts or tools that might be useful and helpful to others. Um, if you want to raise your hand, uh, like we talked about, I will try to call on those in order. If I don't, then I apologize, but we will get to everybody who wants to share. So who'd like to start us off this evening? Erica, let's start off with you. I think in order for you to keep your sanity when you have a chronic illness, you have to one, identify um, that you have uh, a issue of having a mental problem. I have suffered uh, tremendously with just the weight of having an illness. I didn't realize that I was so sick until like the pharmacist of which I went to go pick up my medicine told me that I was sickly. And so for a while I hid the fact that I was sick. Uh, one of my surgeries, they actually clipped my carotid artery um, trying to get out the tumor. And so it just brought on a lot of stress of financials and just the fact that I was just different. Um, you see all your, your friends thriving and you're just stuck and you're always in pain constantly. And for a while I denied uh, getting counseling. And uh, now that I'm in counseling, it has helped me tremendously. I go weekly and just being able to open up um, also groups like uh, Epic Foundation and other groups on Facebook, talking to people that have the same illness that you have definitely helps because it's very, it's welcoming to hear people say they understand, uh, you like the, those words, but it's, it's more of a understanding when you talk to somebody that actually is going through what you have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Wow, yeah, absolutely. That connection is really important, it sounds like, and just being validated can be very useful and helpful for your own sanity. Thank you for sharing that. Zoanne? Well, for me, um, the way I keep saying is to keep a slightly warped sense of humor. Um, I, uh, I've been in the medical profession uh, for years and you, you tend to get a kind of a little skew on things. So I proudly announce that I currently have 17 diagnoses, take 25 medications and, and, and as you probably all recognize the dot, dot, dot. Um, it, it makes for very interesting when you go into the emergency department and they say, so what brings you here today? And you start reciting the list. Um, but I, I try with that to keep it light. And because if I'm smiling, then someone else will smile. And so when you smile, you get one back, generally speaking. And if I can bring a smile with my 17 diagnoses, um, then I feel like I've made myself feel better when I'm trying to make other people feel better. So that's my coping. Oh, that's a great that's way. Self-care oh and also helping others smile too as well. Yeah, great. Uh, Chanel. This is a loaded question um, <laughs> because I, I definitely, identify as somebody who is, I, I have been going through my, I guess my own reckoning with my reality. Um, that's the best way I can put it. Uh, just for a little bit of background, um, I am the daughter of a social worker. So I kind of, uh, I grew up 
thumbing through the DSM four. So I, and we've talked, we've always talked a lot about our feelings in my house. So I'm, I have a lot of like insight about my own feelings. Um, but I also, I also got sick with Cushing's at 16. And so that was like middle of puberty. I was, I had a very active life, um, very active just in different activities. And so I remember when I got sick, it was like, first of all, first off, I pretty much diagnosed myself. So there was, it was almost kind of like the trauma of going through that, of having doctors not believe you and going through that. And then all the other steps in between to get the brain surgeries, to get the BLA, to get the radiation, have all that stuff done. And you kind of, as that time passes, so I'm 30 now. So it's been almost over 15 years of me uh, going through all of my health stuff. So as that time passes, it's like you kind of let your dreams die a little bit along the way. So the only way that I've been able to reckon with my reality and pull myself out of like the denial and the trauma of everything I've gone through is just honestly constantly staying in therapy and having a support system because I wouldn't be able to get through. My parents have been through all of this with me. Um, and so they're really great to talk to, but my husband's also here, but also having that neutral person that you can go to so you're not like dumping everything on everyone else. So constant therapy is my number one recommendation in my personal coping mechanism. Well, it sounds like uh, therapy and also connection, just staying yes. connected with the support system and people that that share in your experience with you. Absolutely, great, thank you. Nancy, what about you? Um, for me personally, I went, I was hit head on in a horrific car accident. I was pinned, I wasn't expected to live. My children were injured. I went from a full-time mom of five children who'd only been married a few weeks because we'd been, you know, you know, blended family to flat in the bed. And um, I faced, you know, a sudden instantaneous life change. And I really had a lot of um, seriously, you know, breakdown, but I still had to be strong and I still had to be positive and all these things. And what it actually really took was me kind of taking a step back and I had to mourn who I was before that moment in life. And I had to make in my own soul, something like, I guess, literally like a funeral of who I was before. And I had to then focus to embracing who I was from that minute forward. And I know it sounds kind of hokey to think that way, but I couldn't live going that way because if I was constantly that way, I was never going to go that way. And it, it, you know, no amount of anger, no amount of frustration, no amount of hatred and fear and just rage, literally rage was ever going to make me into something better or, you know, what I was then. And so that for me was my biggest epiphany moment of, of how to just reshape who I was. I mean, I'm always going to have remnants of who I was, but I'm also going to have better pieces of who I am after it. So, I mean, that's kind of my perspective on how I kind of got through that and journaling too. I actually was cleaning up and I found something when I was kind of going through that self-pity funeral I had for my old, my old life. And I seriously was kind of looking back and I thought, wow, I really remember how I felt that way. And I just don't feel that anymore. So, you know, that kind of gave me that cathartic feeling of getting rid of it. So that's kind of just my thing. And it's okay to, to never be who you were before and to embrace who you are because you've got better, in a lot of ways, better qualities as you are a survivor. You know, and, and when you give yourself that pat on the back, it certainly helps. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. And especially just, you know, being able to find new strengths in yourself, like and using that as a, a way to move forward and figure out what to do with those new kind of strengths that you have. Absolutely. El Sarita? Um, the way in which I think of coping is through lots of prayer and meditation. I know if I don't take the time to just pray, meditate and do a lot of deep breathing, I could kind of freak myself out, but just a lot of deep breathing, a lot of rest. And you, I find out when you're resting that you're you know, doing some self-preservation and you're restoring your body to the state that you really desire it to be. Um, I know oftentimes as well, 
when you're in pain or um, you're dealing with uh, your illness in a way that people can't understand, oftentimes you just have to step back, rest, meditate, and try to focus on positive things and focus on spiritual things that will help you to gain the strength within so that it then starts to reflect in your you know, in your body. So I really do believe that a lot of prayer, speaking positivity, a lot of meditation and self-preservation through rest, taking your medications, eating the right things, listening to your body and just um, absorbing in that moment is of the utmost importance. Great, thank you. Yeah, so a lot of physical things too, like just listening to yourself and listening to what your body needs at the time is really important. Great, thank you, Karen, yes. Um, I'm speaking from a caregiver point of view, as I mentioned, it's my daughter who has been dealing with a chronic illness. And um, I also work in the healthcare field. I'm, I'm an occupational therapist and I, my focus is in home health care with elderly people. And I find that for myself, that when my biggest, I guess, break from our daily life and everything going on at home and the constant medical appointments and all the things that go along with these kinds of situations is putting my focus on other people. So when I go out and I see my patients in their homes, I am really just focusing on them and they get 110% of me. And I find that that is such a break for me to just focus on other people. And then it also uh, hit me, um, Elzarita, when you talked about um, being able to just sort of go into Zen and you know that kind of a thing, um, because my way of doing that is actually cooking because that's, that's sort of my way of meditating because I find that when I have a sharp knife in my hand and I'm chopping, 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 I cannot focus on anything else. I need to just be paying attention to what I'm doing there. Um, so I do a lot of cooking and I watch YouTube videos of new recipes the way other people watch movies and TV shows. And that just gives me a little time to myself and a little bit of time away from um, our situation at home. Great, thank you. So it's so kind of a balance there, focusing on other people 110% and then focusing on yourself 110% yep. when you need to. Absolutely. What about um, in terms of your environment? What is it that you, um, what is it that you do in terms of people around you, in terms of your space? What, what helps to kind of manage your emotional state, your physical state? What are some things that you've done for that? Anybody want to share some tips? Yeah, so uh, I'll go there. Uh, and a lot of people might think it's strange, but, uh, you know, one thing around my house is that, you know, uh, uh, it, it's, it's, it's really, I enjoy a clean house. And a lot of people get frustrated uh, when there's junk around, but, you know, nobody likes to clean, but it really helps me feel uh, empowered uh, to, to to clean stuff up, you know. And so uh, I've been I'm telling everyone when 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 I get low, when I get uh, sad, uh, I go clean. So I feel like there's a lot of power in that. And, and you know, a, a famous saying that everyone around here knows is that you know, Darth Vader says you don't know the power of the dark side. I say you don't know the power of cleaning stuff up. So, <laughs> you know, that gets me going. Sometimes it's, it, it takes just a little bit to get me there. Uh, but when I'm, I'm doing, a, when I'm cleaning up, it's just like I liken it to those home shows, the home improvement shows where they, they, they uh, you know, they take this junky house or this, this, you know, disheveled place. And then they, at the end of the half an hour, you know, the place is immaculate. And you see this huge transformation. And so to feel like you had a hand in doing that, and you are actually empowered, it, it has a way psychologically of giving you power uh, and control over maybe some things that you can't have control over. So, you know, you don't know the power of, of cleaning stuff up. It's very powerful and it's very, very enriching. Uh, so it's my little spiel. <laughs> Wonderful, yeah. Well, you know, if you ever need to have that power, I've got a whole place here that you're <laughs> welcome I'm to. Very, uh, <laughs> Very domestic Thank friendly, you. so. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. Uh, Zoanne, what about you? What are some things that have helped you or what you can offer? I want him to come to my house. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you know, you're talking environment and the first thing that came to my mind is music. 
I need to have music in the background. I live alone. And sometimes the silence in and of itself is, is pressing, oppressive even. And so I have different topics um, of music. So I have my soft music for days when um, anything over just a bare whisper is too much for my body to handle. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very, very light, let's say um, harp type music, very soft, very gentle. And then for days when I'm feeling on the top of my game, it's show tunes um, and, and sing-alongs. Um, you know, I love kid songs. Um, a farmer in the Dell, okay, laugh. Um, but I, I, simple, but yet if you get into the rhythm, that simple little song can break a, a pattern of, oh, I feel terrible, oh, I feel yucky. Um, and, and then you kind of go around the house singing, the wheels on the bus go round and round. Okay, I defy you not to smile because I saw smiles all across the panel when I said that, right? It, it makes the, a difference um, in, in my environment and then that makes a difference in myself. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Now I'm going to have that tune in my head for the rest of the night. <laughs> so, that's all good because I'll keep a smile on my face. <laughs> that's helpful. So let's go to Nancy. How about you? Um, you know, surrounding yourself with people that that understand what you're going through and not feeling um, that you can't speak up and tell people if you're having a bad day, you know, if you're around new people that may not know you well, just explain to them what's going on. You don't owe them an explanation necessarily, you know, and, and don't be hard on yourself, you know, just kind of verbalize what you need from other people because you know they certainly will do that to you. And as we we are, are very skilled at hiding our illness, how we really feel, things like that, and, and it's okay to verbalize what you need and, and just set up your environment to, you know, speak up and, and, and take care of yourself on that. Yeah, absolutely. So having a, a good support system can be very helpful with that too. Absolutely. Dr. Dana. Hi, I'm not great with tech. So thanks. Thanks for understanding. Um, I was so glad to hear you say Zoanne about music um, that really resonated with me. And I was thinking actually um, that I, I've heard a lot of clients talk about the, the things that we bring to our kids, the things like like uh, the wheels on the bus, that there's something about that that reconnects us with, um, I don't know if it's that part of ourselves or a sense of freedom and wonder in the world. Um, and then a lot of clients that I've talked to have found a lot in doing other sensory stuff, right? Like um, I have somebody who put a, just a vanilla scented candle by her door. And she, as soon as she comes in her home, she smells it and her, she describes that her whole body just revs down. Um, so yeah. So thinking about music and, and scent and lighting, there's so many dimensions there. Yeah. So anything yeah. like related to the five senses can be helpful mm -hmm. things that you could use in your environment to just kind of stimulate sensory information. Absolutely. Um, we do have a question from the audience and I will get to that in a moment. I just want to make sure the person knows that. Stacy, what about you? Stacy, did you want to share something? I had just raised my hand earlier to answer the environmental, you know, surroundings and things like that, but we yeah. can, can move no, on. No, no, no. Go on with this. What, <clears throat> what was your suggestion? So I definitely um, agree with Craig about having a nice clean space. Um, it, when you walk into a place that's clean, you can feel like you can actually relax and put your feet up and actually take that time to rest. Um, but also something that really helped me was to um, finally sever relationships in my life that no longer served me um, in this chapter in my life right now. Um, it was really hard for me to try to juggle relationships when still trying to you know make sure that my daughter was happy and when once it got really overwhelming and I was able to sever those relationships that was like a clean house to me you know it was like I could breathe again and um 
one more thing. Finally, it got to the point where we, our daughter had been sick for so long and it got to the point where every single time we went in to the public, um, everybody would ask me a million questions about our daughter's diagnosis and how she's feeling. And, and it went on for months and months and months. And finally, when I was brave enough to finally send out a huge mass text to everybody, you know, saying, please, I know that all you, you like care about us and you, you know, you want the best for us, but if we're in public and our daughter's with me, ask her how she is and how her day is and how her day at school was instead of how are you feeling? Oh my gosh, I can't believe how big you've gotten and wow, you're growing, you know, like it, it needed to be more, hey, hey, how's your day? You know, instead of everything always being like, oh my gosh, is she okay? You know, and once I was able to put that out there, everything full circled and, you know, all of her friends were better with who she was and everything just worked out a little bit better that way. Yeah. So really just validating her experience and, and Absolutely. recognizing that this is a part of who she is and not mm -hmm. to deny it even. Absolutely. Yeah, that's great. Chanel? I'm not sure if anybody can see me, but I'm over here like ferociously shaking my head because um, and I wrote down actually two things. I wouldn't forget them. Uh, the first thing I will say is uh, I what Nancy said really resonated with me. Um, I you, she was talking about like the people in your space and what I was thinking of just offshooting straight off of what she said was um, uh, when you have people in your space, I know like right now is one of those times where you're probably more likely to have certain people in your space because we're most of us are quarantining and everything like that. So I am with my parents and my husband. And so I am the only chronically ill person in my household. So um, as much as my, my parents and my husband are the absolute best um, support systems, they're still able-bodied people. And they still oftentimes need to be educated on um, the disabled, chronically ill experience. And so not so not only so that there are better support systems to me, but when they turn around and go out into the world, they're better support systems to other people because there's no use in them just supporting me only. And then if they encounter, you know, chronically ill people out in the world, nothing changes. So I'm huge into like social justice and like educating people. So when I have the energy and educating them, sometimes I don't, but often when I don't, I will write a note to myself, get back to that later, teach them something later. <laughs> and uh, the second thing as an offshoot to uh, what Stacy just said is uh, huge boundaries. Boundaries is so huge. And I am definitely a people pleaser. I definitely love to be the person that everybody likes and the one that everybody defers to. But um, I have come into a new phase in my life and to my 30s and Realizing that having those kinds of relationships where I am everyone's go-to and where people want things from me and they'll like, they'll approach me and they'll say, hey, I've been thinking about you, hoping you're doing well. By the way, I need this from you. Like, no, you can't do that anymore with me. Um, so boundaries, education, so that people know how to uh, treat me and I establish rules for how you treat me. I always try to treat others with the utmost love and care. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, so boundaries are really important. It sounds like, uh, and I see other people nodding their head too, that that is something really important to be mindful about in your environment. Um, we'll go to Henry and then we'll go to Dr. Karen. And then I want to get to the question that one of our audience members asked. So Henry, do you want to go next about the environment? Sure, I'll um, make it real quick. Just going off of what uh, Chanel and Stacy had said, you know, being mindful of who we let into our environment. And, you know, um, my dad used to say this all the time. I don't know if Dr. Tim's ever heard my, my dad say this, but one of the one of his biggest proverbs was, show me who your friends are and I'll tell you who you are. And when you have, when you're surrounded by people who are not positive, who are negative, who are you know, damaging, you find yourself being a negative, damaging person yourself. But if we surround ourselves with people who are positive and uplifting, we find ourselves becoming uplifting to others and ourselves as well. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Karen. Thank you so much. I uh, feel like everything that everyone said here. Am I muted? Nope, you're gone. We can hear you. 
Oh, oh, you can hear me. Okay. I thought uh, my husband was telling me I was on mute, but you can hear me. Okay. Um, I was saying that um, everything that everyone um, has said uh, resonates with me. And I'll just quickly um, just pick a couple of things that were particularly uh, profound to me. Uh, the music thing is definitely um, a big thing for me. Um, it's always been very therapeutic in my life. I'm classically trained vocally. And um, so is my 17-year-old uh, daughter. And so we're like constantly singing duets together <laughs> in the house. I tell her that we need to do TikTok, you know, like make that money. But, you know, she doesn't want to sing with her mommy. So anyway, um, <laughs> um, I'm just joking. But, um, you know, I, I love it. And The Greatest Showman, um, if you have not seen that, it's like one of the best movies ever. And um, whenever I need inspiration, I will um, pop that in um, just to get into that spirit of, um, you know, not only being positive, but like there are songs that talk about being at low points that I can relate to and then relate to and then getting to a high point. So that's very important. But I also want to piggyback off of what Stacy said. And thank you for opening up that conversation, Stacy, in terms of boundaries and how you liken having a clean, uh, having the appropriate people in your circle to having a clean house. Because, you know, I've been cleaning house for the last couple of years and it's been very uh, cathartic for me. I call myself a recovering codependent. And I, um, like Chanel describes, you know, um, you know, and I am in recovery, so congratulations to me. Um, but, you know, in all seriousness, you know, it was a big thing because I grew up, um, you know, and there's some cultural context to it as well. Um, I grew up in a household where, you know, you just learn how to people please and take care of everyone else first. And so especially having an organization that takes care of people, I have to be constantly mindful of that. And then the last thing I'll say real quick is the energy vampires. I've been really mindful of the energy vampires, those people who suck the life out of you. And so not only is it important to have those people in your circle who support your vision and support what you want to do in your life and being a healthy person and having healthy boundaries, but you want to create a circle around you or like sort of a, a shield around you where you're not letting people in who suck the life out of you and who drain your energy. So I'm a work in progress, but that's very important as well. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So touching on a lot of the, the different things that people have said about, you know, boundaries and um, their support system and keeping negative people out of your circle, those kinds of things. Karen, did you want to say something before I, I just want to add question? something really quickly as far as um, positivity goes and having po people that are positive in your life. Um, I've had to let some friendships go over time also, definitely. Um, but because of the COVID situation, I've put some time into volunteering at a drive through food pantry. And I have found that um, if you give a little time to doing anything volunteer, whether it be, you know, an hour, whatever, People who volunteer tend to be really positive people. You know, they're there to do something good for others. And I found a very positive group by being around people that are also volunteering their time. Great, you know, and that actually leads into the question posed by one of our uh, audience members. Um, the question is, uh, and this is for all of you, how do you overcome or stay positive when people in your home are not on the same page at the time? Yeah, I see some of you like, mm, yeah, okay. What do you do to stay positive when other people in your home are not there? I can't tell who's raising their hand and who isn't. So I'm just gonna call your name. Okay, Chanel, we'll go with you first and then I'll go through the list. Okay, so this, this might be controversial, controversial uh, answer, but um. Sometimes I get angry, but a controlled angry and anger that, because I, again, connecting back to my, um, my love for social justice and just generally, um, a lot of great change in this country, in this world, in every situation has been fueled by anger. That does not mean, you know, running around biting people's heads off, but taking that anger and identifying, okay, why am I angry? 
why am I really angry? Because it's not about, you know, the way that the toilet paper roll is hanging on the thing. It's not about, you know, something, my stuff being moved. It's about something deeper most of the time. So to figure out what that anger is about, feeling that anger and directing it somewhere where it's, where it's not going to hurt anybody. And then once I kind of reflect on, okay, why, what am I really angry about? I am, I'm very good for calling a family meeting in my house um, and saying, Hey, this is, this is a deal. I'm, I'm upset about this and we need to talk about this. And then we like, uh, usually 10 times out of 10, we figure it out because there's nothing that I don't think talking can't solve. So yeah, I don't, I don't necessarily think that um, there's a, there's a concept called toxic positivity. And I do think that if you delude yourself into thinking that anger is not real or valid, you can start getting yourself into toxic positivity where you're like, oh, well, I'm just going to be positive. Yeah, I'm really pissed off, but I'm just going to be positive. At some point, that's going to explode. So feeling your feelings, feeling your anger, channeling that anger into something that is useful um, and that forwards, you know, betterment within your circle, within your household, within your environment. So. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. So, I mean, it sounds like even just basically identifying that you're feeling something, you know, whether it be anger or disappointment, even that they're not on the same page as you are or whatever that means that, that even just acknowledging and accepting that you're having these feelings and it's okay to have these feelings because that's your experience of it at the moment. And I, I like the idea of calling a family meeting <laughs> and just saying, uh, no, we got to talk about this right now. That, yeah, so that, that's a great one. Um, El Cerita, you had your hand up. Well, one of the things that I practice as an educator is um, I try to be a role model to my students, but being a chronic warrior is challenging because you have to have on a persona all the time. Um, but one of the things that I teach them is something very simple, which is to stop, think, and calm myself down. So I have to try to stop myself from reacting, um, which may mean I may get in my car and drive 20 blocks away and get some vitamin D and um, may listen to some music. And it'll give me a chance to reflect and think about what's happening and then once I'm able to think about it, I may call a confidant or someone who is able to say, you're crazy, or someone to say, you know what, this is, you know, they might help to balance me out because I know with people that I can confide in, um, with people that are in the same category as me as a warrior or someone who understands that I'm the only female in a household full of men, sorry guys. Um, then they can give me the strength I need to return and have a valid placement. So I stop and it may mean like I said, going for a drive, getting some vitamin D in my skin, listening to some music, going for a walk, you know, just, um, and ironically, I may walk through the cemetery because it's quiet and it's not the dead I'm afraid of, it's the living. <laughs> so, um, just walk somewhere quietly, talk to a confidant if I need to, to listen for their input and to, to find that commonality and then calm down and bring myself back to the table, sort of like Chanel with that family meeting or to be able to rationalize my way through all this extra testosterone. Yeah, well, it sounds like it's, it is taking care of yourself is what happens when they're not on the same page as you, that you you do what you need to do to take care of you. And even if that is leaving and taking a drive or walking somewhere or getting or calling somebody that you know is gonna be supportive for you, whatever that may look like, it just sounds like you identify that, okay, no one else is on the same page right now as me. I, I need to do what I need to do to stay okay right now. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's great. I hope um, whomever posed that question out there got some answers for that, but I wanted to see if anybody else had a comment that they wanted to share about that. Yeah, please, Dr. Dana. Hi, um, I did just want to put out there that I think a central question might be whether or not you feel that you will be able to get your family members or your friends or whoever you're living with on the same page with you, or whether you might be um, trying to buy milk at the hardware store. 
And sometimes accepting that you might not be able to get what you need from a particular relationship can free you up to provide it for yourself, to look for other places where those needs will be met, um, and to let go of continuously trying to get it from someplace where it's just not going to come, if that's the case for you. Yeah, that's really important too, is looking at where, where are you trying to get a need met? And is that the, the person that can give it to you at that time? Absolutely. Did anybody else want to um, offer anything for that? Give um, a hand. Oh, go ahead, Nancy. To kind of bounce off what she said, um, I, I know personally myself, um, because I am a chronic pain survivor and my child is a chronic illness survivor. Um, <clears throat> So if I breathe wrong, she panics and, and I just start I'm breathing, I hurt, I'm breathing. Um, sometimes you have to look at the situation and, and the people in your home, they may not have what we're dealing with and it just may be life. And, and we are so, I don't, I don't know what the right word is. I don't want to use self-absorbed, but we're so, we're so sensitized to everybody looking at us that it may not have anything to do with us. And, and it may be that they're dealing with something else and they feel like if they talk to you about it, they're gonna burden you. And they know you're stressed and they know you're at a, you know, mom's gotta have, you know, this, that, and the other. And sometimes just having a frank conversation with the other person and just, you know, don't always assume it's you that's the issue. It could be something completely not. And it, and it goes back to being kind to yourself and, and self care to yourself. You know, we're not, always going to be the reason somebody's testy or aggravated and those kind of things but it's super easy for us to live in that zone so I don't know you know for me I found out a lot of times especially dealing with my child dealing with me it doesn't have anything to do with anything and she's walked around thinking I was mad you know so you know don't don't always just assume things mm, wow that's great uh, Karen did you want to say something Yes, I, I did want to speak to something that Chanel said. Um, I definitely think that the family meetings are a great idea. Honey, we're having a family meeting every week from now on. <laughs> I'm just putting that out there. Okay, so I'm going to move on now um, because I think it's important for everyone to be transparent and communicate. You know, one controversial thing um, in, in my life was, um, and I'll try to be a little bit less uh, long-winded, but is being very transparent with my children. I have a 10-year-old daughter and I have a 17-year-old daughter. My 17-year-old daughter experienced um, me as very healthy until she's about eight years old. And then life changed for her within a blink of an eye. I was pregnant with Cushing's disease, as it turns out. So my eight, uh, my 10 year old daughter has known me to battle chronic illness for her entire life. So they see things from a different lens and it can create, you know, different reactions. But one thing that has been a very big thing for me is to be in constant communication with them at age appropriate levels, but to not hide it from them. Because I know a lot of parents, a lot of clients that I worked with even before I became ill, they would freak out if their kids saw them cry. And I would tell them, this is how they develop skills in life. They have to know that sometimes mommy is sad. She's not always this perky, you know, bubbly person that feeds into some of this toxic positivity that we're talking about. So um, that is definitely a uh, uh, first and, and foremost thing uh, for me, um, being mindful and being present, which, you know, I'll, I'll talk about a little bit later too, is, is really um, important. Um, but I, I want to also speak to really quickly, the folks who are in the stage of their chronic warrior journey, where they feel dependent. I went from having a thriving private practice to literally within one day, it seems like writing letters to my clients saying, I could not come back, I'm having brain surgery. It changed for me instantly. And then I became completely dependent and completely bedridden and had to have 24 hour supervision. And so as we talk about getting our needs met, you know, there is a dynamic that exists where uh, let's just put it out there, you have no other choice but to depend on the people in your environment. And at one point it was my mother, God rest her soul, my mother-in-law, my husband, my, you know, that circle. So if they were in a bad mood, 
I had to figure out ways to deal with it. I mean, if they projected blame or anger onto me because of they were angry at my illness, I, I had to manage that as well because I was stuck in the bed, not even able to move my right toe. So I just want to speak to those people who really are in that place who are, who are um, struggling with how to deal with it when you're fully dependent. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, Stacy, go ahead. Um, I also wanted to <clears throat> just throw out there as well, a lot of people that I come in contact with, um, they don't really have the skills to communicate or they don't have the self-confidence to open up their mouth and tell people exactly how they feel. Um, so even simply writing a letter and then giving it to the person in your household who's having a hard time understanding where you're coming from, I feel like that is a great outlet too for people. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. Absolutely, writing a letter. And sometimes that could be easier than asking. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, Craig. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks for the opportunity. I wanted to, to speak on the topic. Uh, I was really moved by what Dr. Dana uh, had said uh, in you know, getting the milk from the, the hardware store. What, what, one saying that I live by and what's, what resounds in me is the saying to embrace your limitations. And in that way, you can maximize your capabilities. Um, and what, what that means is that we all have limitations. And sometimes uh, it can be quite lonely. It can be very uh, 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 harrowing, uh, disheartening when you can't get your loved one on the same page as you uh, for, for various reasons. Uh, but we all have limitations you know, for various reasons. They're just not able to understand. They're not able to pick up on, they just don't get you. Uh, but we all have limitations. Even you have limitations, I have limitations. That person that you, you hope will, will support you has limitations. And chronic illness people just know it best because they have experienced it. Uh, so that saying really resounded in me. And it is possible to definitely get support, maybe not from that person that you're trying to get it from, but support is out there. I have personally been supported, not by, you know, not that my own family just did not support me, but a lot of the support that I got as a caregiver, uh, it did not always come from the people that I wanted for it to come to come from. Uh, those ones who were loved ones that I was hoping would understand my situation a little bit more and get more support than I, than I actually got. Uh, but that support was all around me. It's just that I just had to, I became more aware of it uh, when I opened up my eyes to see it. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the idea that you accept that person for who they are and for, for what they are and what they can do and the limitations that they have is important for everyone. You can't make someone understand you. Uh, you can't make them, them uh, uh, in, in some ways you might sway or push the needle one way, but that's really up to them. That it's their, their, they have the power to do that and you should not assume power because or because they won't, because they will not. Uh, but the key is to find support. Uh, you embrace that limitation and then just to move on, move on. Don't go to the hardware store looking for uh, a, a gallon of milk. Uh, go to the right place where you will find find support. That was really powerful. I wanted to speak to that and, and say that that really resounded in me when, when, when that was said. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I'm going to have that uh, saying in my head along with the wheels go around and round. So that will be my, <laughs> my motto for this evening. Um, Erica, did you want to say something? I know that you had your hand up. I was just going to say in terms of how people handle um, and your family handle your illness, I have been on such a long journey with my chronic illness that it has actually made me introverted. Um, suffering from this illness has made me lose my voice from the lack of the support from my family. I think in my family, being like a, a family that has been through like sports and all like they tend to say, you know, toughen up and things like that, especially having Cushing's disease. It's a disease that's very non-forgiving because of the fact that these surgeries are through your nose. And so people don't see the physical uh, surgery scars and things like that. So people just assume that you're fine. I mean, 
they're in their mind it's like you put on weight but they don't see the physical ailments that comes with having Cushing's disease and so you feel like you're always trying to defend your chronic illness and you just get tired at, at some point or another and then you just end up like just shutting down so whereas Chanel uh I agree with you wanting to have a meeting I just literally just gave up and just shut down um I also found out that it was easier for me to just find and put my energy into other things starting a nonprofit organization and being an advocate has helped me to just channel my my energy somewhere else but that's what I have done wow yeah that's pretty that's powerful thanks for sharing that Erica you know, I wanted to um, touch upon something that came up and we got about 10 minutes or so left, um, but something that a couple of you mentioned, uh, which I thought was uh, pertinent, especially since we're talking about mental health and, you know, how do you take care of your mental health? How do you take care of yourself um, from a physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, environmental perspective? Um, and I think Erica, it was you that mentioned this um, about being different and about living with something different. Um, and I'm curious to know, you know, from a mental health perspective, how, how do you take care of yourself? Um, you know, when, what, like what Erica has shared um, so vulnerably about people don't see that you have this illness. People don't see that you, you know, take care of somebody that has an illness. So how do you manage that? How do you keep yourself together basically with all that? What are some things that you do? And I'm not sure if I, okay, thank you. Cause I couldn't tell if somebody was raising their hand or not. Henry, do you want to go first? Oh, we, we can't deny the power of positive self-talk. You know, uh, I think sometimes we have to be our own hype man. We have the, every day we have the choice to either be our worst critic or our best cheerleader for, for instance. And sometimes we have to keep in mind, yes, other people don't see the struggle that we're going through or the support that we're giving others, but we know it to be a fact, you know? And so sometimes we have to draw on that and remind ourselves and use positive affirmations to be the, to be the encourager that we need, you know? Yeah. And it also sounds like even just kind of taking it one step further is like just validating your own experience. Absolutely you know, that this, this is something you're going through. This is something that you do and nobody is going to necessarily understand that. And they don't necessarily need to, it's just, that's your experience. Yeah. Dr. Dana, please. You're on mute. I wanted to also chime in that I've seen that for so many people, um, finding the strength in that difference and the value in having a perspective that other people might not necessarily have and experiences that other people have not gone through, that there's something very valuable in that, that um, there's a sense of understanding your own resilience there's a sense of really knowing how strong you are because you've you've been to your limits um and i found some people be really empowered by having something different doesn't necessarily have to be something negative absolutely yeah anyone else want to share about that yeah karen go ahead um i try to remind my daughter a lot that everybody is different we don't know what everybody's story is but when you go out in public everybody has a story and even though and while you're putting your game face on and getting through your day at work or whatever other people are doing the same thing and you just don't know it you know and i think that my daughter as some of you i know know her um chanel you remind me very much of her she's younger than you but throughout her illness, she has become more and more of a voice for any underdog out there. And she will be the first one to tell me, like maybe that I used a wrong word, you know? So I hope that I um, learn from her without jumping on her, you know? <laughs> but um, I see the value in that, although this is obviously not great that she has dealt with this, she's really gained a lot of strength as an individual from it. And that, Everybody out, everybody out there is different. We're all different. I don't live with a chronic illness, but I'm different from everybody else and still have my strengths and weaknesses. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So Anne? Well, um, and, and I, I apologize. I didn't 
remember who actually said this about friendships. I have divided my friends uh, almost unconsciously into those who've known me before I got sick and those who've known me after. And I have to remember which one I'm talking to. And so for one set, I can be um, a bit more uh, teaching about my illnesses uh, because they have no idea what I've experienced. And so they ask questions and sometimes they don't even ask the questions, they look the question. Because I'll make a comment about a medication I'm taking and they'll go, what the heck is that? And why are you taking something that has such horrible side effects? So I try to use that as a teachable moment um, of, well, sometimes the cure is not quite worse than the disease, but it comes really darn close. And so, you know, to take that extra minute to say, hmm, okay, this is, this is where that's coming from. But the other thing, and, and thank you to Dr. Karen um, for the zebra, because I am a very proud zebra and I have embraced my zebra-ness. I am different as everyone is different. And I am, no one else has my issues, but I don't have anybody else's either. And so I have Cushing's, but my Cushing's is not the same as other people's Cushing's. And so we can all learn from each other as well as teach each other in our differences, you know, as much as the joy of finding the similarities, but also the joy of embracing those differences. Beautiful, thank you. Nancy, did you wanna share something? Um, I guess maybe on the aspect of not being with chronic illness in this situation, but of watching somebody that has chronic illness. Um, can you hear me okay? Uh, you're kind of staticky. Let's try it again. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I don't know. It was it was acting up. I was fiddling with it before. Okay, um, I'll go back. Uh, not from being a chronic illness survivor myself, but watching my child. The thing I deal with is um, she doesn't realize how strong she is. She sets herself too high of a goal. She sets herself um, up, I think, and it it is hard for me to watch sometimes as a mom and. The person who know who knows how strong she is, you know, it is okay to have a bad day. It is okay to fall apart. It's okay to be, you know, a quote normal person. You don't have to be superhuman or project yourself as superhuman. And you know, I think sometimes you just need to remember uh, to cut yourself a break, you know. And and I think you know that's the thing that I, I struggle as a mom watching my child beat herself up sometimes and it, it's hard or to feel like she has to be because she feels in her own sight that she's got so many things quote wrong or failures or things she couldn't accomplish or or having to make excuses for things that she forgets how really strong she is so kind of yeah thank you very much uh craig how about we go to you? I don't think I lowered my hand from the last uh, <laughs> round, but uh, no, I do have a thought on this though. Yeah, uh, please. You know, uh, I think it's important as a caregiver, you know, again, and just, just from that, that perspective, you know, people, they ask questions and the ones who, who really know, you know, your, 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 you know, your, your, what you're going through and, and all that. And, and people, some of them genuinely do want to give you support, but, you know, I, I just do want, want to speak to the voice of the, the person who's, who's, you know, get tired sometimes of having to answer that question, you know, uh, you know how's your wife doing? How are you doing? You know, and, you know, sometimes, you know, with chronic illness, uh, people want to hear they're doing great, they're doing better, but, you know, the, you know, there might be some ups and downs, but, you know, most of the time it's about the same and sometimes it's even worse. And, you know, I get stuck in that lull of, you know, automatic answers. Doing great. It's fine. It's doing great. 
but you know, every now and again, I just have a little fun with it, and I just be brutally honest. It's like, oh, it's terrible. It's God, it's horrible. I couldn't sleep last night. My wife was up. She was throwing up. It was just terrible. And, you know, I I don't stop there. I go on for a good, you know, five ten minutes, and then you know, and most of the time that just kills it. They don't ask me the question anymore. <laughs> It's just really fun to do that every now and again. You got to work it up, though. You know, the people, they got to get used to you giving them a nice, simple answer because, you know, it's it's. Uh, but no, that's that's fun. But, you know, <laughs> that that that's sometimes things that's a little bit cathartic uh, to do that. But, you know, it's it's a it's it's a struggle sometimes. Sometimes it's not easy. Uh, there's no easy answer uh, for some of these things. Uh, I want to say for everyone who's on the call, uh, you know, there's more than one way to skin a cat and everyone has their own experiences and what works for them and what they have learned. And it's really enriching to understand how different people, you know, the human spirit is so resilient and how you actually process this and you've make, made something which isn't optimal, uh, but you've taken it and you've made it a positive and uh, a, a, a point, a source of inspiration uh, for people like me and, and people all over the world. Uh, so it, it's strength. It's strength. It, 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 you know, sometimes you get into this attitude uh, or this, 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 this rut when you're ill of, you know, what was me? And I'm in so much pain and nobody has it worse than me. But, you know, we, we all in some way, shape or form, we get down in that rut, not to the same degree. You know, it, you know, that the winners in Chicago, uh, sometimes I hear people in Atlanta try to compare, oh, it got cold down here, too. It got down to 32 degrees. And, you know, I tell them it's been it's been in the teens here for three months straight. It hasn't even gotten to be huge. You don't know what it's like to be cold. So, you know, it, it's that thing of, you know, they know best. Uh, they know best. So so sometimes it's, it's great to hear these stories of inspiration. It's great to see how people are coping. And these challenges are, in fact, real. Uh, so. Thank you. I want to say, I, I want to tell you, it's been a great honor to be on this panel and, and, and listen to the voices, to hear others uh, speak their, their words, which are very valuable. And uh, it's, it's absolutely been a pleasure. Well, thanks for that. And you kind of just summed up everything I was going to say to close us out for the evening. So I'm not going to say anything more to that, except for Dr. Karen. I don't know if you have any words that you want to say. Wow. Well, what a powerful discussion. Again, I am so blessed that each and every one of you joined us tonight. I know that our viewers gained a lot from hearing your insights. I know that you guys took time out of your lives to be here because you want to give back. And look at Erica, we're <laughs> epic strong. You know, and strength doesn't mean never having a bad day. It means honoring your space in whatever space you're in. We put one foot in front of the other every single day, whether you're a caregiver, an advocate, a patient, chronic illness warrior, each and every one of you has a story and you have chosen to give back. That is the amazing thing of about everyone on this panel is that you've taken everything that you've experienced and you've given back to the world in different ways, but what a gift that is. So I thank you, I feel so blessed and I have immense gratitude. I have a deep sense of gratitude for it. And I wanna say not only are we epic strong, but together we are epic. Thank you so much, everyone. We'll see you soon. <laughs> Bye.